Hello, everybody. This is uh, Mike Pesciello with the Pesciello Group, along with my colleague, uh, John Metz. Uh, we're uh, excited to um, uh, have a, a very special friend and, and colleague and guest uh, with us, uh, Ms. Lainey, Ms. Lainey Feingold. Uh, Lainey is going to be uh, speaking to us on, uh, on a very uh, Topic, uh, on a topic that is very near and dear to her heart, and maybe to yours, as it is certainly mine. Uh, what's law got to do with it? Role, the role of uh, law in developing an accessible, usable uh, digital world. So um, just a couple of quick notes here for, for the folks that are uh, out there listening. Uh, once Lini gets started, we'll turn the uh, session over to her. Um, if you have questions, and we really want to encourage you to ask questions, we're trying to save about five to seven minutes at the back end of, of, the, uh, of the session. Post those to uh, the Twitter feed. It's a hash mark ID24, hash mark ID24. And uh, John Metz is, is following, uh, following that hashtag and will make sure that we uh, ask, uh, ask your questions to, to Lainey. So... Without further ado, I'm going to turn the uh, uh, tables over to uh, to Lady, and uh, we'll uh, we'll give her the show. Go okay. ahead, Lady. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks to the whole ID24 team. It's really exciting. It's good to be here. Thanks to the audience. Thanks to everyone who cares about how the law fits into the accessibility and usability space. Um, so now I'm going to screen share my slides which will just take a second. Let's see. Now we have this thing, and then I do this, and you should see my slides. Yeah, we see them, Lady. You're all okay. good there. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, the name of this session is The Role of the Law in Developing an Accessible, Usable Digital World. And I have up here, my Twitter is at LFLegal. And I'll have the rest of my contact information later. Always happy to talk to people about the law, answer questions. Um, I know some people, when they hear presentations, especially one from a lawyer, they like to take a lot of notes. But I have up here the link on my website. My website is lflegal.com. And I have a legal update tab in the high-level navigation menu. And the first thing there will be the spring 2016 legal update on all the cases and laws that I'm going to talk about today. So I have links to press releases and other things I'm going to mention. So you don't have to worry about uh, taking notes. I know the slides don't fully contain all the information. So the direct URL for the post is lflegal.com 2016-05 legal-update-spring16 Easiest way to get there is to go to lflegal.com, go to the Legal Update tab, and you'll see the first one up will be the most recent one. And as you scroll down, there'll be links to all the legal updates I've done. I started doing this a couple years ago when I realized that there really is a hunger for understanding what the law is doing in this space in an easy-to-understand way. So that's why I do the updates, and I, I hope they'll be helpful to people. Uh, real quick for people listening who don't know me, who is LF Legal? Um, I'm a disability rights lawyer. I work in Berkeley, California and around the country. I have represented the blind community on digital accessibility issues for the past 20 years. Um, I have on the slide the header of my website, which has Law Office of Laney Feingold, which is really just me, um, Structured Negotiation Disability Rights. Structured negotiation is an alternative dispute resolution process that uh, the blind community, blind individuals, my colleague Linda Dardari and other lawyers and I have used for 20 years to work with organizations without filing lawsuits while at the same time enforcing the civil rights that we're going to be talking about today. So structured negotiation, we don't file a legal complaint. We approach an organization, we explain what the problem is in human terms and in legal terms and offer to work together on a solution. I've done it uh, with a lot of big organizations in the US. The first web accessibility, I know that's a focus of today, the first web accessibility agreement was with Bank of America in 2000 and they became the first bank to uh, commit to having their online uh, 
online banking platform accessible. They've been a great partner ever since. We've done similar agreements with Major League Baseball, working on their website and mobile app. With uh, this ties into what Kel was talking about earlier with uh, Anthem Blue Cross on their website and mobile app accessibility with a lot of large banks. Uh, we just did one with Denny's. So um, that's who I am. I do this work in collaboration with my clients and with the organizations. And I also want to just say one word about the LF Legal because it ties into, I think, all the themes of ID24. So when I put up my website um, in 2008, I was going to call it LaneyFeingold.com. I know a lot of you listening have had websites long before 2008, but I got my first one in 08. I was going to call it LaneyFeingold.com. And my friend Josh Mealy, who's a scientist and an inventor and who's blind, he's like, you can't call it LF, you can't call it LaneyFeingold.com. No one will know how to spell it. No one will spell Laney right. No one will spell Feingold right. And no one will ever find you. So Josh came up with the idea of LF Legal for it to be easier for people to find and because he said I needed an address that would fit in one line of Braille on my business card. So I like to tell that story because I didn't pay a fancy brand company, even though I'm sure they do great work, but I listened to one of my users, and it turned out LF Legal did become the brand. That's my Twitter handle. That's, that's what I use. So it all came about. It's cognitively easier for people, and it fits on one line of Braille. So um, let's start talking about the law. I'm hoping you're going to leave the session uh, thinking that the law belongs in a place you might not be thinking of. Obviously, the law belongs in a courthouse. The law belongs in a lawyer's office. But I like to say that the law belongs in your back pocket. And I have a picture on here of a pair of blue jean back pocket with some tools in it, a scissors, pen, pencil, measuring tape. Um, and those are tools of the trade. Well, the law has to be everyone's tool, not just for lawyers in this space. Uh, disabled people need to be able to take the law out of their pocket and say, it's my right to be able to use this mobile app so I can find out health information. It's my right to go to a voting website and be able to read about the candidates even if I can't use a mouse or see the screen. So the law isn't just for lawyers. I'm going to try to share with you what's happening in the legal space right now, primarily in the United States. And I hope you'll leave the session thinking, oh, this is something I can take out of my pocket. Not just for disabled people. If you're on a team and you're an accessibility champion in-house, you most likely are getting pushback from someone somewhere, and the law can be one of your tools. Not the only tool. You notice I didn't pick a hammer to put in the back pocket because the law doesn't have to be used as a hammer. Um, which is what I think the best thing about structured negotiation is. Um, but if you're an a in-house champion, if you're an advocate, you can use the law to direct lead people in the right direction. Uh, so the real big picture, if I could only put up one slide and if I had to stop talking right now, the right to accessibility in the digital space is a civil right. And I have a picture here of a march protest in advance of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and there's a banner being held up that says, Injustice Anywhere is a Threat to Justice Everywhere. It's a Martin Luther King quote. Uh, the protest is led by wheelchair riders and other people with visible disabilities. They're holding the banner. It's an iconic Americans with Disabilities Act picture, and it really is the core of all the rights, all the details, all the structured negotiations, all the cases. Everything we talk about when we talk about the law and accessibility is about inclusion, it's about access, it's about full participation, and it's about civil rights. So let's start with the US Department of Justice, which is the agency in the United States that is uh, responsible for the Americans with Disabilities Act. The first slide, I, I don't really like to put URLs on slides, but this is very important. And I like to say bookmark this. The Department of Justice has a website all about the ADA, and it's ada.gov. And on 
that website, everything they do to enforce the Americans with Disabilities Act, including very important work to make web, mobile, kiosk technology accessible, is on that page, ada.gov. Two weeks ago, they put up a new uh, sub-page of that, which is access-technology. So it's ada.gov, access-technology. Have a picture of the page in the next slide because there's four top uh, navigations on that page. One is enforcement, one is technical assistance, one is regulations, and one is technology initiatives, all under the main heading of accessible technology. And the enforcement tab is the tab where the Justice Department lists everything that they are doing and have done for well over 10 years to make websites and mobile applications and other technologies accessible. And they put that up uh, two weeks ago, and you can, they have, on the enforcement tab, they have links to every settlement. You can read all the settlement agreements, all the press releases. Um, so that's something in your back pocket. If anybody says to you, oh, well, the Justice Department, there's no ADA regulations, you go to this page, you take it out of your pocket, and you say, yeah, well, the Department of Justice has been enforcing people's rights to digital access for, I think their first agreement on this was 10 years ago. Um, and the reason they put that page up about two weeks ago is because two days later, they did something that is illustrated on this slide with a U-turn symbol on a road to nowhere. And that, unfortunately, is the image that came to my mind when two days after they posted this great new page on accessible technology, they announced that they were withdrawing regulations specifically requiring the details of web accessibility. Many of you who are listening know that six years ago, the Department of Justice said, we think we're going to put out some regulations about web accessibility. In that document that they put out, they said, the ADA already requires website accessibility, but we think it will be helpful to have some regulations. So they put that out in 2010, and now in 2016, they took them back and they put out a new notice, which they call a supplemental, this is all explained in, in the legal update, a supplemental advance notice of proposed rulemaking um, for public sector websites saying they still want to write, they still want to issue regulations, and here's 123 questions. You can read the whole 123 questions at ada.gov where they're asking the public to help them put out new regulations. So this all happened within the last month. Uh, the regulations they're talking about now have to do with state and local government. There's also another set of pending regulations having to do with private sector websites. Those are also so far in the back burner. Actually, I should have a stove picture. Those, they now say, are not going to be out until 2018. So the story with the regulations is to remember that even though they haven't issued regulations, they have very important work that they're doing and statements that they're making. So in the new proposal, they say the department has taken the position that Title II of the ADA covers internet website access. They say the same thing about Title III. Title II is public sector, Title III is private. They also say in their new document, the Department of Justice believes that level AA conformance to the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG, is the most appropriate standard. So the top agency in the United States responsible for ADA enforcement is already saying this, even though we don't have regulations. So do the web regulations matter? Well, here's what I think. I think they matter, and I think they don't matter. And I couldn't figure out how to do the slide, so I could keep jumping back and forth between yes and no. I guess I could delete them and say, yes, they matter. No, they don't matter. Um, why do I say that? They matter because without regulations, too many companies and government agencies can offer up bogus excuses. 
we don't know what to do. There's no clear guidance. These are the kind of things we all hear, those of us who are advocates, both inside organizations, outside organizations, everyone who's listening to the ID24 stream, I'm sure has heard somebody say, we don't really know what to do, so we're not going to do anything. That's why regulations matter. We already know that the ADA requires website access and that WCAG 2.0 AA is a standard that the Justice Department has adopted, but without regulations, we get bogus excuses. Without regulations, there's an extra burden on advocates, both disabled people who need access as well as people inside. We are wasting so much time and energy convincing, you know, lawyers who don't believe in access or management people who don't want to spend the money on it that this is something needed and required. If we had regulations, it would be clearer, it would shine a light on what already is the law. It also makes it harder for champions inside in teams to say, we have to do this. This isn't debatable anymore. This, this is something we need to do, we're required to do. But no, it doesn't matter because the DOJ, like I said, already says that the ADA covers website. It investigates web barriers. It gets involved in lawsuits for web accessibility. Uh, <coughs> we'll talk in a minute about the lawsuit that's pending against Harvard and MIT for failure to caption all their online content. The Justice Department was involved with that. Justice Department was involved a couple of years ago in a case against H&R Block, a private company um, requiring web accessibility. So there's no excuse for looking to the law to say accessibility is not required. Accessibility is required, and this is something I hope will you know, keep in your back pocket to take out next time someone says to you, well, the law's not clear, we don't know what to do. Um, okay, so those were the AD, we just were talking about the Americans with Disability Act regulations for private sector, public sector websites. Um, there's other regulations, we're also waiting for Section 508, which many of you listening know is the federal procurement statute requiring accessible uh, technology and information purchases by the federal government. Many of you have been involved in a, you know, one decade plus effort to so-called refresh the 508 guidelines. Uh, they haven't, I'd like to say this process is stale. The process to refresh is stale. The Section 508 regulations are currently scheduled to be final in October of this year. However, October of this year is one month before the federal election in the United States, so I, am, I would not bet money that we actually will get the 508 regulations. Um, somehow, the airline regulations are in effect and working in the United States. Airlines are not covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act to the most, you know, to the most part. And they have their own law called the Air Carries Access Act. That law has a requirement that airline websites be accessible and usable, has great language about usability testing. Those regulations are final. I know many of you in the audience are working on implementing those. I think the deadline was originally last December. It's now uh, coming up coming up this June. So that's an example where regulations have worked and again it's the federal government in the U US and they have in that airline regulation statute uh, WCAG 2.0 AA as the as a standard. Um, okay so the civil rights laws are in your pocket. We have the ADA, we have section 504 which which Molly mentioned yesterday which is about federal money Anything that federal money is being spent on needs to be programmatically accessible, which of course would include uh, web, mobile, and technology. Most states have what they call little 504, so when states spend money, that's another place where the law is coming in to say things need to be accessible. In addition to 508 for federal procurement, we have the little 508s in every state for state procurement. We have the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, which uh, the United States Senate hasn't ratified, but I think over 175 countries, I don't have the count right with me, have ratified, and it's a 
really great potential tool for bringing uh, civil rights out of the pocket into uh, the digital experience of people around the world. There's a section that specifically talks about information and communication systems and technology. And of course, outside the U.S., a lot of advocacy is going on in the legal space, the AODA in Ontario, the new EU directive, the new Japanese disability law. Um, so wh whatever your country, and I'd really welcome people to tell me uh, by email or on Twitter, I do have a post on my website where I try to keep up with the international law. I'll put the link up on Twitter after this. Um, but I'd feel more confident to hear from people in other countries about what's going on in their countries. So using the tools, those are the civil rights laws. And I want to spend the rest of my time talking about how those tools, I have another picture of another pocket with paintbrushes and a screwdriver and a glove. I don't know if that's a screwdriver. It's some sort of tool. Um, because laws are only as good as the advocacy that makes them real. Otherwise, they're just words on paper. Um, so we have the civil rights laws in the United States. We have the Justice Department enforcement. And we also have private advocacy that is bringing the law to life and making it a reality for disabled people. So. Um, private advocacy, I have the rest of the presentation organized around rights. The first one is the right to health care information. Um, because like I said, the bottom line of all these laws is not about technical coding, it's about the right to access information and the right to participate. So there is a legal effort going on in the healthcare space to make uh, digital web mobile technology more accessible. I really hope I get to talk to Cal Smith after this because some of what he said overlaps with what's going on in the legal space and what could go on in the legal space. Um, the first up I have here, Rite Aid and Humana. I've been working with the American Council of the Blind and blind individuals around the country on talking prescription labels. Uh, unbelievably, in 2016, People who can't read a standard prescription label often get medication with no accessibility. They get a print label that they cannot read, they cannot see. And we've been working on an initiative to bring talking prescription labels to the nation's pharmacies. Uh, the first agreement we reached in structured negotiation was with Walmart in 2000, I believe 12 now, so four years where Walmart committed to uh, offer talking label solution in uh, through mail order across the country and in stores and today if you request it at your local uh, Walmart or Sam's Club store they will provide it. We've done agreements with CVS and Caremark with Walgreens and the most recent ones uh, were with Rite Aid and with Humana and Rite Aid as everybody in the US knows is a pharmacy company. Humana is a, a health insurance company that also offers a uh, pharmacy benefit service. One thing I want to say about both these agreements with Rite Aid and with Humana, they were reached in structured negotiation, no lawsuit was filed, but most importantly and to one of the themes in ID24, both of these cases as well as every case I've ever done began with uh, what in this field you know you call the user, what we call a client, really a person who had the problem, tried to fix it on their own, couldn't do it, called a lawyer. So with Rite Aid we worked with uh, organizations like I said, ACB and state affiliates who were representing their members. Humana started with three Humana customers around the country. One was in Nevada, one lived in Georgia, one lived in Florida and they all came to me independently unable to access their medication equipment and I just want to give a shout out to Humana. They were a wonderful negotiating partner. We also work with them on health insurance information in terms of privacy, accessibility. They now offer their health insurance information in something other than print as well as they're having an accessible website which they have had for a while. Um, Kaiser and Sutter are two other examples of how the law is being used in hospital and healthcare settings 
to do across the board agreements that affect the websites of these hospitals, the documents, the forms, the kiosks. Kel had a picture of one example of a kiosk. A lot of hospitals are having these electronic medical records. All of these tools that are supposed to be making healthcare more accessible to people in the word accessible, like we don't use it in disability rights, but available, also need to be accessible and available to disabled people who can't access information in traditional ways. And the law has been very effective um, in having agreements. Both Sutter and Kaiser were structured negotiations that my colleague Linda Dardarian handled. I have, again, the links to the press releases. Uh, she worked with disability rights advocates on those. Uh, Dan Manning at Greater Boston Legal Service has, has done great agreements with Massachusetts hospitals on these issues, looking across the board, across disability, to make sure the new technology and the old technology, the paper that's still being handed out, is available to everyone. And that's the way, that's one way that the law um, has been really has been really helpful. Um, there is a lawsuit pending against Health and Human Services, which is the federal agency in charge of Medicare, because their website's not accessible. That's in a lawsuit right now that is pending, and we'll see what's happening. Um, one thing I wanted to just say about access to health care, the law hasn't gone gone here yet, but I was thinking about, I usually mention this, and I was thinking about it especially with Kel's presentation. Um, we have wearables. We also have ingestibles. And I like to use that example when I'm speaking because you can swallow something that will give a readout to your doctor's phone and your phone about what exactly is going on inside your own body. And, you know, I started in this field 20 years ago about access to financial information, which everyone understands has to be confidential and private and available. Well, what could be more important to be accessible than information coming literally out of your own body through a piece of technology that you've ingested? So we have to make sure, and I say we, the advocates, the lawyers, the government, we have to make sure that this healthcare technology is going to be available to everybody. Um, financial information, like I said, that's where I got my start. I worked with the blind community on making ATMs accessible before there were any ATMs that were accessible in the world. And that's how structured negotiations started. Um, I have written a book about structured negotiation that is coming out this fall that the American Bar Association is publishing. And in the book, I have a story of the very first cases uh, before we called it structured negotiation, which is when we wrote to three large banks, told them they didn't have ATMs blind people could use, told them it violated the ADA, but rather than sue them, we wanted to work collaboratively, collaboratively to find a solution. Those ATM cases were successful. They led to our working with most major banks on their web accessibility. Uh, I think the financial industry is a leader, by and large. Not everything's perfect, of course, but um, in working on accessibility, uh, most of the big institutions have have accessibility teams, and it was great to go to Access U this year, Nobility's conference, and a big financial company said to me, oh, yeah, we started working on Access when Bank of America insisted that all their third-party vendors build accessibility in because of the first agreement that we did back in 2000. So um, our most recent work in financial information is an agreement we just did with Bank of America, who's been a great partner all along, to make their mortgage information accessible. Again, like all of this work, it starts with the user. It starts with the blind person, the person with another disability who cannot get what they need to live a life independently and fully. So we had a blind mortgage holder who is a friend of mine who came to me when she couldn't get access to her own information. So Bank of America just took a leadership role in making sure that it's online uh, 
mortgage information is accessible. Another thing we recently worked with them on is their travel reward site. You know, I feel like we did the the uh, online banking platforms in 2000, and this is like my. I'll talk in a minute, and Mike mentioned earlier about baking accessibility into the DNA, which Bank America has done. Um, occasionally things fall through the cracks and this travel reward site was one of them. Again, I got a call from a woman who couldn't book her flight, figure out her miles. So it's not just the big high level, can you, you know, check your account balance, but it's everything that the institutions are offering that disabled people have a right under our laws to get private access to their financial information. Um, okay, I am going to somewhat talk a little faster, even though I think I'm talking pretty fast as it is. Um, okay, right to work. Really important area, an area where the ADA has not lived up to its promise. Uh, in 2016, you can't talk about the right of disabled people to work without talking about the right to digital access. There was an important trial that the National Federation of the Blind uh, was successful in, in Maryland, a woman named Yasmin Rezudin, and I mention her name because too often when we talk about law, we talk about the lawyers, we talk about the case name, but just like in structured nego negotiation, uh, litigation starts with real people, and Yasmin Rezudin was a woman who worked in a call center. They so-called upgrade, they so-called upgraded their call center technology, and downgraded the accessibility. So sad to say Montgomery County, Maryland is fighting this tooth and nail. Had to go to the Court of Appeal. Ms. Rezudin won her trial. Uh, the jury found that she uh, might have been a judge or a jury, sorry. A jury. A jury found that uh, she had a right to do the job. They had to put in the accessible software and they're still fighting about what the solution would be. An important thing on this case is that the, co the county didn't fire her. They put her in a dead end and, you know, come to work, we'll pay you, but you're not really doing anything job. And the court said, you know, that's not really what it's about. It's, a it's about the right to have a job that is meaningful to you and the job you want to do, not barred by inaccessible technology. So that's something to follow. Uh, there was a recent settlement against the vendor site, uh, the General Services Administration, federal U.S. agency website settled in favor of the blind vendors who couldn't access information. The U.S. Department of Justice is doing good work on job applications, saying if you don't have e-recruiting that's accessible and if you don't have job applications that are accessible, well, how are you ever going to have work that's accessible? So that's another area where the law is trying to increase the rights of disabled people to have meaningful work. A lot of uh, legal work being done in the right to learn space, both in higher education uh, and K-12. Harvard MIT captioning case I mentioned. Uh, again, I don't understand why this is a fight. Harvard and the National Association of the Deaf filed a lawsuit. Harvard and MIT hired a lawyer to try to get the case thrown out of court. Magistrate judge refused to throw the case out of court. Again, all of these are linked in my in my update. Um, they're still fighting it. It's something that we're watching. The New Jersey Community College, also I have links in the update, is a good example of work that the National Federation of Blind has done on college campuses, not just looking at ebooks, not just looking at websites, but across the board, what does a student need to be successful? They need all information and technology uh, to be available to them. Similar work is going on by advocates for deaf students. There was a recent, recently a great, very hard fought case where a college refused to, a uh, medical school refused to give a deaf student what he needed to be successful and had a, he had a Successful court case went up to the Court of Appeal, had to have a trial. Again, uh, National Association of the Deaf and a private firm called Steiner Vargas did a great job. And that guy whose name is Michael Argeni, he just 
finished med school. He just graduated last weekend. So uh, the law is really having an impact in the education setting. It, it's depressing to me that there still needs to be these fights and these lawsuits. Um, there's a new lawsuit against the bar prep course uh, called Barbary, uh, brought in Texas by blind students who couldn't have access to the material that they needed. So that was just filed. We'll see what's going to happen with that. And just to note that the Department of Education, as well as the Department of Justice, gets involved in these cases and is using the law favorably. Um, there's also legal work going on in the right to read. There was a great settlement against a settlement with, I should say with, because a case settled, with a company called Scribed, which is like the Netflix of books. The case settled uh, their material, which is tens of thousands of reading materials that weren't available to print disabled people. Uh, will be accessible by 2017. And another recent thing is that the NFB announced a partnership with Amazon to work on their K-12, I think it's just K-12, might also be higher ed uh, platforms and learning materials available from Amazon. So we should see improvements there. Um, a lot of legal work going on right now in the area of the right to vote. Uh, a lot of it having to do with the right to cast an absentee ballot and what online tools are available for that and are those tools accessible as well as information available on websites about voting candidates. There's a lot of legal activity I think of course because we're in an election cycle right now. So we're watching cases in Maryland, in Ohio, two California counties, um, I put Washington State up here because they just announced without any apparent legal activity, although I'm sure advocates had the law in their pocket, um, that they just announced all their election websites are going to be accessible. So it's something to watch. If you're listening and you work for state government and you don't have an accessible voting site, that should be project, project number one. Uh, right to government services, there's a case in Arizona that was recently filed by the deaf community for text access to 911 services um, that was filed by the National Association of the Deaf and it, it just was recently filed so that's pending. Uh, New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio uh, signed a special law just for New York City to make sure all city websites were accessible. We don't need to go city by city because we have the ADA, we have the Justice Department already saying that um, state and local government websites have to be accessible. You'll see that in the enforcement tab on the ADA.gov technology page, but it's still great and a shout out to New York for, for passing a specific law. Um, right to restaurant information. I put this in because access, of course, it's about privacy. It's about serious issues like, like banks and finance and health, but it's also about everything else we all want to do in society. Um, I learned that with a great negotiation we did with uh, blind baseball fans in the American Council of the Blind with Major League Baseball. They were a great partner. Uh, we did a deal with Weight Watchers, again, in structured negotiations, and some of these are talked about in my book, um, that accessibility is about everything, and the law is broad enough in the U.S. to reach everything. So uh, two little things about or restaurant things. We did an agreement with Denny's um, where they agreed to make their website, their mobile app, and their email programs and the emails they send to customers accessible. I think, um, I know I've been responsible for forgetting uh, about the email part. We'll get the website all squared away and the mobile app and a commitment to accessibility, but emails a company sends are a different department and sometimes we skip it, but we didn't skip it here in Denny's. Another thing that's happening is the sweet, a lawsuit was filed against Sweet Greens for uh, their website and their online ordering not be accessible. Uh, great settlement with Netflix recently where they're going to do audio description of all their streaming and DVD uh, movies. That's a follow-up on uh, earlier lawsuit and settlement that they agreed to do captioning. The audio description was not a lawsuit. Um, we just did a re great structured negotiation with Houston Metro on transit information. 
where again started by the users, the clients, the blind transit riders who couldn't get scheduling information, uh, couldn't schedule paratransit, and Houston Metro uh, was a great negotiating partner on that, and I think is now a leader in terms of transit agencies with web and, and local. Okay, I want to quickly talk about how the law is making access stick. And to illustrate this, uh, to illustrate this, I have a DNA strand because, like Mike said earlier, I also say the same thing. We need to bake accessibility into the DNA of organizations we work with, and the law can help with that. So all the agreements and settlements I just talked about, whether they're lawsuits, whether they're structured negotiations, whether they're Department of Justice uh, activities, they all require basically the same thing. Not every agreement has all the elements I'm about to, to talk about, but most of them have most of them. They become best practices because they're into settlement agreements. And I know that many companies and the consultants on the call, they also use these best practices without having to be involved in the lawsuit. But a law, the law is helping, and this is another thing that should be in the back pocket. So real quick, the legal agreements are applying to web and mobile as well as learning platforms, other technology. The standard well accepted is WCAG 2.0 AA. The agreements talk about web accessibility coordinators, independent consultants, training staff, adding accessibility to performance evaluations. When people are performed, if they're, when people are evaluated, if their job includes accessibility, that needs to be part of what they're evaluated on. Um, the importance of posting a policy. I think many of you have heard me say, I know that some company lawyers feel you shouldn't say anything about your accessibility efforts because someone's going to come and sue you because you're not perfect. I completely disagree. I think everyone who's working on this in any way needs to have a very public place on their website where they talk about their efforts. And most importantly, they have a phone number and email where people can call and the phone call will be answered, the email will be responded to in a positive way. When someone calls me and they want me to bring a case against a company, first thing I do is check and see if they have an accessibility information page. And if they do, I say to the person who called me, well, try this. They obviously have some commitment. Maybe there's still work to be done, but it's there. Uh, the agreements require a testing tool and usability testing. And so these are, these are, uh, the best practices of the legal agreement, this is the potential, the potential of what the law can bring to the digital space. Um, okay, one quick thing in my last minute, uh, there are new players in the field. There have been a lot of lawsuits filed, a lot of demand letters sent. I have some of them listed up here. The, there's a suit against the NBA, there was a suit against the company that owns Ugg Boots, I'm forgetting the official name, Brooks Brothers, Mazios, a travel company called BMI, BND, Hard Rock Cafe, Harbor Freight. Um, these suits are filed by lawyers who are uh, new to the field, and I think some of the cases are being settled. Some of the cases, there was recently a, um, there was recently a trial in not a trial, there was recently a ruling in Southern California in one of these cases where the judge said the website violates California state law, which is similar to the ADA in some respects. Um, the, claimant got, the plaintiff in the case got awarded damages. So I think with all these pending lawsuits, people are always asking me, well, what do you think? You've been in it for 15 years. And, um, you know, we have to wait and see. We have to wait and see. Uh, the best practices that we talked about, those need to be incorporated. We need to see if the websites, the mobile apps, are really going to be accessible as a result of all these new lawsuits. Are the best practices going to be followed? But it's something we're watching, and those of us, including myself, and you know, lawyers, National Association of the Deaf, and then NFB, the ACB, we're all watching it and. Um, trying to, you know, if they're in court, we're following the court proceedings. 
making sure things still keep going in the right direction, which is where they have been going for, for many years. So I have a stay up to date slide to end this so we have some time for questions. Um, I'm on Twitter at LF Legal, like I said, thanks to Josh Mealy, I have a great brand. Um, I do have an email list. Uh, you can write to me at lf at lflegal.com. I don't send out very often, but when I do the legal updates, I send that out, and I will be sending information about my book, which is coming in the fall of 2016. It's called Structured Negotiation, A Winning Alternative to Lawsuits, and it's really a manual for advocates and for lawyers who want an alternative way to enforce the law to use the tools that are in your back pocket. Um, the DOJ's ADA page, I really recommend. You can keep up with the DOJ and you can use it in your pocket to tell the naysayers, yeah, we don't have regulations, but we have a strong civil rights law and a commitment to accessibility at the highest levels. So that's what I wanted to share, and I left room for questions. So Mike or John, tell me what to do next. Hey, thanks a lot, uh, Lainey. Um, let me just... Um we have there, so everybody sees us. So you might want to stop sharing your screen, Lee, so we can ask some questions. John, um, you've been following the Twitter feed for ID24 for questions. Are there any uh, questions in particular that you were able to pull out for, uh, Lainey? Am I still on? Yeah, there you go. I think he might be there on mute. mute. I am on mute. Okay. You can't <laughs> talk and you're muted, buddy. Um, yeah. Not so much a question as much as a comment regarding the uh, the Harvard and MIT that NAD versus Harvard MIT needs to produce captioning rules the road for all schools. And I guess I'm how, how do how do these lawsuits and, and I don't even know if they do do they create any sort of precedence in order to have uh, you know expectations for these schools and 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 or just the companies and whatnot um, to take their accessibility to the next level? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, it's something I talk about in my book because in structured negotiation, we don't create legal precedent because we don't have a court saying anything. Okay. But I'm a big believer in industry precedent. And I know from talking to big companies that most people don't want to go first if they're doing something new. And when we can point to settlements either it, from a uh, lawsuit or from a structured negotiation, and this really happened in the prescription area. When we, you know, when Walmart stepped out in front and they did talking labels, it made it easier for everyone else to do. In terms of the court rulings, there are court, court rulings do have precedent. Um, the Harvard and MIT case right now is in the district court. If it went to a court of appeal, then whatever that court said would cover the whole appellate Area, like Boston is in the First Circuit, so the First Circuit um, covers the New England, so it would have legal precedent. But it also, I think these settlements, even when they're done outside of court, they draw attention to the issue, and if the National Association of Deaf and the Department of Justice say Harvard and MIT need to caption, well obviously everybody needs to caption. So you can wait around for the Justice Department to come knocking at your door or you can do what the law already requires without having somebody breathing over your shoulders. Very cool. Yeah. Lady, actually a couple of things that you just said, and we've got a couple more minutes, so I just want to slip these in. One is, uh, it's just kind of ironic that you said um, from a, law, a legal standpoint, uh, most people don't want to go first, which is frankly the opposite mindset of what anyone who's in innovation, technology, um, you know, product development, it's the opposite mindset. And they, I, 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 I always find that puzzling. Um, and, and it kind of goes along with something else you said earlier about, you know, if if organizations, corporations, government organizations, you know, a private public industry, if if they thought about um, taking a positive view and positive steps and demonstrate, as you said, a level of commitment, then I think the communities of individuals with disabilities 
would have some notion of being reasonable, being forgiving, allowing time to go by to, you know, see if these folks are really going to, you know, uh, walk their talk, so to speak. But by not showing any progress, and this is something I've really tried, a message I've tried to convey to others, demonstrate progress, demonstrate commitment to progress. And when you do that, the response that you get from the communities of individuals with disabilities, as well of, as well as all those who are, uh, you know, supportive professionals like myself and, and, and my colleagues in the field, we're going to help you. We're going to be there to support you, um, and 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 that can only be good. Um, which is why the fear factor of lawsuits, I think, is is this. It's this dichotomistic situation where I I personally hate it because I, I just don't I just don't get the notion of using fear as an incentive. Um, but I also know pragmatically that it works. Unfortunately, it works. And it works because I believe these organizations aren't forward thinking. They don't think in terms of these kind of things the way that they do about their own innovative technologies. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I like structured negotiation is because it gets the disabled people in front of the decision makers faster without being filtered through lawyers. And mm. lawyers tend to have a, you know, a what-if mindset, a fear mindset. I think that's the nature of it. And so many times people tell me, not in my cases, because when we do structured negotiations, when we can get a company to engage, they we have seen a lot of enthusiasm. I have, I have to say, but it takes a while to break down the barrier because the inside lawyers are saying, well, you better not do this, and that's what I was saying why regulations would be helpful because people are like, well, we're not quite sure, so we shouldn't do anything. I, In writing the book, I talk about how fear has been a barrier to so much of what we've tried to achieve and how we've used structured negotiation to break that down. We did a deal with San Francisco on accessible pedestrian signals and it took a while to break down a fear that blind people would be confused by audible information. And it wasn't until they could meet blind people one-on-one -on -one and they would say, well, we'd rather have some information than no information if you just put mm -hmm. up a visual walk sign. Same with the prescription labels. There was legitimate fear by the part of the pharmacies. The audio information may be garbled. We don't want to do it. Well, if you give a pill bottle to a blind person without a talking label, you're giving a blank label. So fear is a very real thing that we have to we have to recognize and work with. I agree with yeah. you. Can I interrupt for a yeah. second? I've actually got hey, a, a couple hey, of Hey Joe John, yeah. we got a it's it's twelve fifty two and we've uh, got a big session coming on I know you've got some questions. We'll post them to the Twitter feed. Um, uh, Lainey, thanks so much. A great great presentation. Um, and uh, I feel very confident that uh, other folks will follow up with, uh, with, with some questions. So uh, for those folks that are watching ID24, we're going to pick back up in about another seven minutes. Hey, we've got a great session, a very special uh, session uh, brought to you um, uh, by uh, Sony Interactive Entertainment. Uh, the next session will be uh, titled Uncharted for a new adventure in video game accessibility. So uh, pick back up with us in about seven or eight minutes. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank you again, Lainey. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, John. Thanks, Bye. 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 Bye.